one. My name is Dr. Douglas White, and I'm the editor-in-chief of today's host, the American Journal of Emergency Medicine. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar entitled, Point of Impact Testing in the Emergency Department, Diagnostics of Respiratory Viral Infections. I'd like to take this time to thank our sponsors at BioFire for making this event possible. Before we begin, let me remind the audience that we will have a question and answer session following the presentation. Please submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Ask a Question button on the right-hand corner of your screen. I would like to encourage you also to input questions as and when you think of them during the session. This will be addressed in the Q&A session at the end. The more questions you ask, obviously, the more robust the discussion and the better the session can be. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you and welcome today's speaker, Dr. Burke Nesters. Dr. Nesters is Professor of Medical Microbiology and the Director of the Laboratory of Clinical Virology at the University Medical Center, Groningen. He's been working the last 25 years to develop and implement molecular technologies and automation processes within clinical virology. Recently, his interest has focused on regional epidemiology, automation, including middleware solutions, as well as the cost-benefit of rapid point-of-impact molecular testing. Since 2000, he's been involved in quality control aspects within the international network of QCMD. He's co-authored more than 200 peer-reviewed papers and reviews, including emerging viruses like enterovirus D68 and hepatitis E virus. Without further hesitation now, I'd like to hand the discussion over to Dr. Nesters to begin his presentation. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. White. Um, welcome. I'd like to uh, discuss with you and share uh, some ideas we have about the emergency department and how we used uh, respiratory viruses uh, during respiratory seasons uh, in the last few years. Um, I call it point of impact testing, and I'll tell you in a few moments why I think this is very important to call it point of impact. First of all, some uh, disclosures uh, I have to, uh, to mention. So um, I will present uh, how we are interlinked to each, uh, with each other. I want to show you and uh, present some facts on molecular diagnostics we probably all uh, are aware of. I will discuss briefly the diagnostic triangle. I will discuss the H stewardship portfolio, the Euro Hour concept on cost benefit. I'll show you uh, some uh, ideas about proficiency, proficiency testing and the ISO guidelines, which are very uh, dominant in, in, in Europe, and what are the challenges for new targets uh, uh, we are encountering every year. So what is the UMC, the University Medical Center in Groningen? Groningen is a small place uh, uh, about uh, 200 kilometers from Amsterdam. It uh, has a large uh, uh, referral hospital and has also um, a large transplant uh, uh, program, including also uh, not only adults but also children. And a number of our patients are immune compromised and therefore they require isolation for from patients with respiratory illnesses. And also, for instance, lung transplant patients, it's very important to be sure uh, that we can protect them from uh, respiratory infections. We are interlinked, uh, which uh, is shown somehow in this uh, uh, slide. So on this slide, you see how the patients are referred in the Netherlands. The red uh, dots are the eight uh, uh, university hospitals. In, uh, in the Netherlands, and these eight university hospitals are interlinked uh, with regional centers and local hospitals. So these are smaller primary care or secondary care uh, centers. But we also know then that in, for instance, this uh, circle on the um, uh, right uh, top of the slide, that's actually where our patients are, are uh, uh, deriving from in, uh, in our area. We can look uh, then more briefly, about, uh, more uh, accurately, how this is uh, linked to uh, Groningen. So Groningen is the UMCG. Uh, there's another center very close to the, to the city. And, and most of our patients, we know where they're coming from. So that also implies that once we have respiratory infections uh, during the uh, seasons like we have right now, we know now where our patients are uh, transferred uh, from. So we have a, a good collaboration and a, a patient relation between the city of Groningen and the city of Leeuwarden, but also to uh, other cities like Zwolle and uh, Arpeldoorn, which are the red uh, triangles. 
but also the smaller hospitals are interlinked with each other. We are very close to each other. We know where our patients are derived from. But if you look into our own hospitals, then we see that if you think about patients and how they are moved continuously between wards and between uh, 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 several uh, small clinics within the center, we know that they are not aesthetic, uh, uh, they do not stay static within uh, the hospital. So this is the summary of actually two years of uh, patient uh, trans uh, transferring and moving within the university hospital. And you see the biggest uh, crowd is actually the red dots, which are the uh, general hospital, the intensive care units, uh, the infectious disease uh, units, while the uh, pink uh, dots are, is the, uh, kin uh, the, the children's clinic. So patients are not static and stay in the bed. So that also implies that if you're moving a patient with an infection, whether it's a respiratory infection or another infection, you have to be sure that you take the, the proper uh, measurements to avoid uh, uh, nosocomial infections. But actually, it's not that static as you might, might uh, anticipate. So if there is a referral between, uh, uh, between hospitals and actually between uh, centers and within a, a clinic, you actually also have to be aware that if you want to prevent infections like respiratory tract infections, um, we are uh, moving globally uh, uh, continuously. We are traveling uh, around between Europe uh, and the United States or Asia, and actually patients with an infection can be within the other country within a couple of hours or actually, actually everywhere within 24 hours. So I just want to be sure that uh, to, uh, to make you aware of the fact that despite the fact that we try to avoid infections, we are actually a one global community which is traveling continuously. And viruses are traveling together with us. So I want to uh, start with point of impact, from classical PCR to point of impact systems. And the question is, why do I call it point of impact testing and not really point of care testing? People are using a point of care testing for a number of reasons, but if you look into molecular diagnostics, I do believe that at this moment it would be maybe a better uh, description to call it point of impact. We are at this moment actually at the initial introduction of new systems that enable the rapid diagnostics of um, respiratory virus or viruses or gastrointestinal viruses. And this is moving so rapidly that we are not sure what uh, the clinical implication of that is. It's not compared to measuring glu uh, glucose, for instance. Rapid implies actually near bedside testing, or while the patient is still waiting for the results at, for instance, an emergency room or an out-of-office uh, uh, or ward. I'm convinced that the new rapid molecular testing uh, do have impact, but they're still in development. And development uh, means that uh, we have still to define the quality indicators for these systems, like what is an acceptable clinical detection limit, uh, because most of these systems at this moment, if not all, are a qualitative uh, system. And we have to be aware that in molecular diagnostics, quantification quali uh, uh, can be important, and we have to be sure that... Uh, uh, we need to understand the value of these essays. So therefore, clinical support related to the interpretation of the results is very, very important, and we're still learning a lot of that. Point of care testing implies something else. In, in Europe, uh, actually uh, globally, there's an ISO guidelines 22870, which com in combination with uh, a new ISO guidelines for med medical microbiology laboratories, um, has to be compliant for this essay if we really call it point of care testing. And excluding in this case is the self testing or in a home or community setting. So people call it point of care, but uh, I call it point of impact uh, for this presentation uh, 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 to be sure that we have to be aware of the fact that point of care it doesn't really imply that it is as easy as we initially maybe would like to have it. Uh, in development. 
a respiratory, to, a respiratory season as is, is very dynamic. We all know that. Um, if you look back to the respiratory season 2012-2013, when we initially uh, uh, started working on this project, um, the influenza season was uh, characteristic by two types of influenza viruses, the H1 and the H3, which were um, present simultaneously. And it had a, a lot of impact because if you have a huge respiratory season, this has a huge impact, at least in our hospital and probably in more hospitals, on the number of isolation rooms. The, uh, we needed to have a number of patients admitted to, into single rooms to uh, prevent uh, uh, infections to other patients and definitely to prevent infections to other high-risk patients which were still in the hospital. Rapid testing, we know antigen testing uh, during the seasons had a very low sensitivity. Um, therefore, we had to switch to other uh, better antigen testing, or, or in our case, we had to switch to molecular testing. But besides the fact that uh, we looked at influenza viruses, we also had to be uh, uh, aware of the fact that during the respiratory season, there are more viruses that are present simultaneously, like, for instance, respiratory syncytial viruses, but also other viruses like uh, human metapodemia viruses, adenovirus, uh, um, coronaviruses, rhino, and influenza. And we know that high-risk patients definitely um, are prone to infections with other viruses other than influenza and uh, RSV. So if you look at the uh, season uh, 2013, sorry, 2012-2013, you see uh, there was a huge amount of influenza uh, A, huge amount of RSV, but there also at the end there were a lot of uh, coronavirus and rhinoviruses present uh, in our hospital at the, uh, in the different wards. Typing these viruses is quite interesting because, as I mentioned before, Influenza A viruses was, uh, there were two influenza A viruses present simultaneously. So the influenza H1 and the H3. And this has uh, a number of advantages if you look at uh, patient management because if you co can cohort patients, you can also have a bigger room with four patients with uh, influenza H1. You can cohort them or another room, a bigger room with influenza H3. So then you have less problems with the a lack of isolation rooms as it is. Those days we started using uh, 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 the film array and compared that to our laboratory developed uh, test systems. The biggest uh, difference is actually noted in the, this slide. A routine PCR, a routine in-house uh, or laboratory developed PCR uh, took on the average uh, uh, just over a day. Uh, if you would do genotyping, in addition to that, it would uh, and uh, it would add about uh, half a day. So you would be around uh, one and a half to two days before you really had a final result. So if you had a patient at the emergency room, uh, you would have a definite result, whether it's positive or negative, within uh, two days, which uh, we believed was actually not really clinical relevant anymore if you had to look at patients at the emergency room. If you use a, a rapid testing, like a film array uh, uh, respiratory uh, system, you would have the result within uh, one and a half to two hours uh, after the sample arrived in the laboratory and whether it was a positive or a negative result. It was definitely an improvement if you look at the uh, uh, patient at the emergency department. So if you look at virology in general, we know that we had to change something. We had to uh, move from uh, in-house assays for specific uh, patient groups to what I call point of care or point of impact testing. So if you look at the overview of what's possible um, from uh, uh, the point of view that's commercially available, you see that high throughput testing is really not that of interest for this kind of patients. It's usually for blood screening or commercial uh, uh, STD screening or for human metapodemovirus screening. Uh, point of care is actually limited by um, uh, the number of assays that are available. Might be just for influenza or just for noroviruses or just for influenza plus RSV. But the number of um, assays that's uh, commercial assets is available for respiratory viruses with an easy to go sample in result out is really limited. In-house testing is always possible. It, it can detect everything. 
it's not really commercially available, or primers and probes are commercially available, and they can be used uh, in Europe. It's a different situation compared to the United States, but not really a sample in result out uh, that's uh, found routinely. We all know that molecular now 6 at least I hope you all know that molecular diagnostics is very important for our laboratory. It gives you a lot of information in acute infection um, in, in a patient, and uh, it's really an integrated and as a solid and a very important part within the diagnostic repertoire of this laboratory or in most laboratories. But we have invested a lot of money uh, over the last uh, years, both in equipment, in radiation, consumables, but everything was really from different diagnostic companies. And a lot of assays had to be developed by ourselves. So if you look at the laboratory developed assays, the number of assays is really huge. We also are all aware of the fact that if you look in virology, patient diagnostics, the treatment and the safety of the patients on avoiding nosocomial infections is very important. A short turnaround time has impact on everything. And it has also impact on the use of antibiotics. So if you know that a patient has a uh, with a very high sensitivity and specificity and most likely has a respiratory infection, you can decide to avoid the use of antibiotics. But the availability of point of impact technologies is too limited. Because this is how our laboratory looked, uh, looks like. Uh, most of the assays from different companies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, no communication uh, using uh, electronic transfer, no middleware solution, um, that's really a, a, a bottleneck in this area where we should be able to connect everything as it is. So there are some options and are really some hurdles and, and how can we move forward? I will show you um, what happened in 2014-2015 in the respiratory season, how we had the discussion. Uh, with our clinicians at the emergency department, and this is still going on uh, during this season uh, as it is. The experience we had from the last few years was that there were still a lot of patients, uh, um, and patient samples receiving at the end of the day and also at the end of the week on a Friday, so after 4 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. And we also know that uh, these samples at the end of the day, by the end of the week, and in the weekend had a too long turnaround time. This is actually not really um, acceptable. The season 2014-2015 was characterized by a really large diversity of different respiratory viruses, as well as it was a very long period, of five months, which is really long compared to the other seasons. And we needed to have for our transplant patients, if you look into the lung transplant patients, which uh, um, was shown, at, which was presented himself or herself at the emergency room, we had to be sure that there was an infection and there was no rejection uh, occurring. So the clinicians wanted to be sure that um, we can make this discrimination or support the uh, clinical evidence for that. We had a lack of isolation rooms because the, the respiratory season was really huge, and uh, the, rest, the isolation rooms was the limiting factor. Uh, a lot of uh, patients uh, had, to put, had the potential of being admitted to the hospital and then transferred to another hospital uh, because we had no isolation rooms. And there was also a request uh, for data on more viruses uh, that circulated simultaneously by the clinicians. So um, we... Um, decided to uh, do the following. One of the uh, uh, easiest things to do is to, to extend the service hours seven days a week from 8 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock in the evening. We um, selected a, a point of impact test with a short turnaround time. In our case, it's the uh, BioFire film array system, which is uh, this mo at that moment and uh, probably at this moment also the only system that's uh, currently uh, available. Be sure to include not only influenza viruses and RSV, because there are also other viruses which have a huge clinical impact on our patient population, like our lung transplant patients with uh, para-influenza type 3 is definitely something uh, which is a risky uh, uh, combination. And we had an agreement with the clinical departments which were servicing our emergency uh, room, our emergency department, and our division to improve the diagnostic service because that was the bottleneck, by selecting very early at the emergency department process those critical ill patients which most likely had a viral infection and take the sample at the early stage. 
So if I can have a clinical sample very quickly um, while the patient uh, uh, was presenting him or herself at the emergency room, that has a huge impact, and I'll show you why. And we know from a, a, a lean project, which was uh, done by the emergency department, that patients stayed in our hospital approximately four hours at that uh, room. So within a four-hour period, we can do a lot. So if you look at the uh, number of uh, respiratory viruses at the, uh, in, the year, in the season 2014-2015, you can see that uh, not all of the um, uh, viruses were detected by using the uh, film array system, but we also had still a huge amount which were detected by in-house assays because the patients were admitted already at the hospital or we had a different uh, logistic uh, uh, routing for that. In this slide, it shows you which viruses were detected. Besides influenza A, at the end of the season, influenza B, you see a lot of um, uh, uh, RSV, but uh, if you look at uh, week uh, five, starting week five from 2015, you see that a lot of rhinoviruses, human metaparema virus is becoming more dominant. You see that there's a, really a number of viruses, not only RSV and influenza, which were detected using the system. So that, again, points out the fact that um, it should be discussed that there's more uh, than those viruses uh, that can be detected. And we also have to be aware of the fact that if you have a negative result, so a non-detectable result, that also has a huge impact. So we uh, agreed the following. We counted... Uh, um, how long the patients were admitted at the emergency department. So once the patient was registered at the emergency department, the quest first question was, take the sample as quickly as possible. And we uh, and, uh, made a note of uh, all time points. And, and in the this slide, you can see how long it took from the patient registration until we had a request for doing diagnostics. And that implies that the physician or the nurse had the clinical sample in his or her hand. So you already can see that within the first hour, 62% uh, of the samples um, were already um, uh, available for uh, presenting themselves to the clinical virology department, which is about five minutes in the tubing system away from the emergency room. So in two hours' time, close to 90% of all the samples were already at the emergency, uh, sorry, uh, were at already uh, available at the diagnostic uh, department. So then how long does it take to um, get a result at the pathology department? So once the sample is in, you can see already that after about 18 minutes, um, the first results are already appearing and they are uh, returned to the physician. Um, at the, um, at the uh, clinical virology department, it's not only taking care of the sample by itself, but it also you have to do uh, registration in the laboratory information system, so all the data are available, but since we have electronic request system, that's done very rapidly. So within uh, two hours, uh, again, 60% of all the data are um, returned to the emergency room. So within three hours, it was close to just over 90%. So the total turnaround time that's uh, uh, on the next slide, that's showing from patient registration at the emergency room until feedback to the nurse or the um, uh, physician is actually uh, uh, not too bad. Um, Within three hours, 60% of all the data are back, and within four hours, that's the time that the patients on average are at the emergency room. It's uh, over 80%. Uh, actually, uh, once the physician knows that the result will be available within 10 or 15 minutes, uh, they just wait these uh, 10 or 15 minutes. So that uh, works fine. So now we know um, actually um, where we can improve our uh, diagnostics and lean projects uh, in this way to improve the uh, turnaround time. So we know now where our focus is. But we have now, with the agreement with the uh, clinical department, the emergency department and the diagnostic department, I think an optimal way to uh, do good patient care 
and diagnostics at that emergency room during the respiratory season. Next slide. Uh, okay. So then the question is, uh, if you look at diagnostics, this is what I call now the diagnostic tri uh, triangle, there are a number of things that are important. Of course, diagnosis itself, you have to make uh, sure that you take the appropriate uh, um, diagnostic uh, process. You have to be sure that quality is good, something uh, which is very important in the different ISO guidelines. But you also have to be aware for this kind of uh, patients that the time to result or the turn around time is an important issue. And uh, we have improved that uh, uh, in a different way, but uh, uh, by using the laboratory information system and our middleware solution, we can now even text the results from the patient directly to a, uh, to a phone of the treating physician if the physician cannot be uh, uh, called uh, and, and reached as quickly as we anticipated. So it really improved diagnostics. Um, this is how approximately the routing is. Um, the uh, uh, mean turnaround time at the uh, um, emergency department was uh, one hour and 12 minutes. Um, if you count everything, um, the uh, turnaround time at the uh, clinical virology department was just over two hours on average, two hours and two minutes. So the whole process from uh, registration of the patient to getting the result back to the uh, to the uh, physician was just over three hours, and then the physician can decide if it's a negative result. The patient uh, uh, can go home. There's nothing to worry about. Uh, if the patient has just influenza, is not really clinical ill, he can be treated and also sent home, or if if necessary, the patient can be admitted. But now, he or she has the uh, most of the information she actually. Uh, would like to have. And if you compare that to the previous situation, on the average, uh, it took uh, uh, too long before we got the clinical sample because the physician uh, thought about it uh, the next day or uh, by the end of the day. And uh, the turnaround time, therefore, at the um, uh, clinical virology department was too long because definitely if you include the weekend uh, or overnight uh, testing, uh, that was unacceptable for um, most of the patients we have seen. So the room for improvement definitely worked. So from 36 hours, approximately back to close to four hours. So then the question, of course, is since this point of impact uh, testing will continue to be implemented in a number of settings and a number of uh, phonology, is this affordable? Because at the end, everybody talks about, is it cost beneficial? Actually, everybody talks about cost not about benefit. So if you look to a, a, a financial director, he always say this is very expensive um, and he only talks about costs while we think uh, it should be, uh, should be also the subject of benefit. Benefit can mean a lot of things. It can be financially beneficial. It can also be beneficial for the patient itself. We try to um, find a solution for that. One of the uh, um, solution is um, um, that we should discuss the following. We should discuss not only diagnostics and cost. Um, we should look diagnostics together with antimicrobial stewardship, which is a very important uh, topic, not only for uh, bacteria, but also for viruses. We should uh, talk about uh, infection control stewardship because if you know what's going on, uh, can you uh, prevent other um, uh, patients from infections in your hospital? And we should uh, talk about diagnostic stewardship. It's not only diagnostics, not only infection control, not only antimicrobial stewardship. So that's why we now talk about the eight stewardship portfolio take diagnostics as an important uh, tool, uh, talk with that uh, to the clinicians, uh, to uh, whoever wants to, to listen to it, and make understand what's the value of diagnostics, also the clinical value. And you have to make uh, people aware of uh, the use of proper diagnostics as it is. Then the question is, how can you... Um, make this 
visual in money. It's not that easy. Um, I think we all uh, have the, the, the issue about how can you make something visual about what's really the cost. So uh, we uh, tried the following um, and implemented that uh, in our setting, uh, f and we used this as a, as a case, the Euro Hour concept. So the Euro Hour concept is something where you um, combine the cost of an essay combined to the turnaround time. Because this turnaround time is very important. Should you start stop treatment? Should you isolate the patient or not? Can you cohort patients? Or can the patient go home? So if you combine this turnaround time with the cost of the essay, then we should make, make something new, which I call the euro hour, which you can compare to electricity. If you have a bulb of 100 watts, they're definitely uh, more expensive than a bulb of 3 watts. Um, and the euro hour concept can be used to uh, discuss the benefit. How do we calculate benefit? Uh, that's not always uh, um, that, um, that easy. Um, but I think uh, time to result uh, for critical care is important. We, we, I think we all are very convinced about that. Um, we also must be sure that the most important stakeholder is the patient. Um, actually, we never ask the patients, what do you want? Do you want a long or short turnaround time? Because we know the answer. But the patient is also a very important stakeholder. And um, we also have to uh, consider what are the costs of our in-house essay or laboratory developed essays compared to point of, in point of impact testing. Um, what are the costs per result? Do we have to uh, uh, hire additional personnel or have to uh, pay additional costs uh, because we extended our working hours? Um, what are the costs of unnecessary isolations because we didn't know that the patient had not an infection or what are the costs of, of putting a patient in another hospital and finding a bed in, uh, in one of our regional centers. So that's why I think that negative results or non-detectable results are extremely valuable. So do we know something about reducing nosocomial infections due to a rapid turnaround time? Um, and then very important, um, how do we calculate money that we didn't spend? So if we didn't lose money by avoiding nosocomial infections or that we didn't have to uh, outplace a patient to, a, to another center, we didn't spend that money. But how do we calculate that? And how can we make sure that some of this benefit, it's a benefit, uh, is really uh, visible? So I tried to give you an example about what we think uh, is uh, um, the case in our, our center. So um, with this, this data set I showed you before, we had um, 641 requests from the emergency department and from close to 500 we had all the data. So we know the time points when the patient was registered until uh, you get the result back to the physician. So in the old situation where you only did laboratory developed essays, um, we uh, calculated, and that's approximately, that the result for influenza typing was about 70 euros and we needed about 120 to 200 euros for uh, the total set of respiratory viruses, including labor, quality control, overhead, equipment and maintenance, etc. That would imply that for these 492 sets of data, we would spend something between 64,000 and 100,000 euros. But we know the mean turnaround time. That used to be 19 hours. And therefore, the point of impact value is um, the combination of time to cost, uh, which is approximately 2,400 to 4,000 euro hour per diagnostic result. That's money in which we combine the cost of the essay or the range of the essay, depends how you calculate, and the time. Using a rapid testing, like the film array system, we needed additional uh, labor cost, which was about uh, 6,500 euros. We uh, know how much money we pay for our, our result. It's about 
for the film array. Uh, we needed additional labor costs you know, during the weekend, etc. We had the results. So then, if you know the mean turnaround time, that implies that the point of impact value is only 366 euro hours per result. It's always less, but the question is, is it relevant? That's something we still have to find out. The reason is, it's more rapid. That's very important. It's more rapid. And the other reason is that um, we, don't know, we don't need to spend too much money on quality control and uh, equipment and uh, maintenance uh, in our laboratory. So in the old situation where we have this uh, point of impact testing for only the virology department, we see that the result of the in-house assays, as I mentioned, is something between 2,400 and 4,000 euro hours per result, while with the point of impact value with a rapid testing is much less. So the benefit for a point of impact assay would be something between 6.8 and uh, uh, 11 times that of a laboratory developed test. Assuming equal clinical value and assuming the same characteristics which you would like to have in your um, laboratory. If you not only take into account the um, diagnostic department, but also the emergency department, then it becomes even worse because the turnaround time at the diagnostic department is now uh, in the old situation and, and combined with the emergency department, 36 hours. For the film array, it was uh, on average, the mean was about just over three hours. So you see, if you combine everything uh, in the whole process from admitting, uh, registering the patient at the emergency room until you get the result back, uh, a point of impact testing is even more uh, beneficial compared to in-house testing. Can we really calculate that? It's uh, not that easy. We tried to do that. Um, how do we calculate that? In red, you can see are the costs, and in green are the benefits. So compared to the old and the new situation. So we spent more money on the film array. Uh, but on the contrary, we didn't do any in-house testing and in-house uh, uh, typing, which is something which is also very expensive. We didn't spend that money. We needed additional personal costs. But we also avoided 181 isolations because a negative film array um, is uh, very important. The question is, how expensive is a bed per day? Um, it's very difficult to get an accurate uh, number of that. Um, uh, in our case, um, we put it at 855 euros a day, but I think uh, it can be even higher. So due to the rapid testing, by avoiding these isolations, we had a benefit of 150,000 euros. Then the question is, how many nosocomial infections could you avoid? There are some data about that. Um, presented by Jacobs et al. in 2013. Um, and we know how many nosocomial infections uh, we can see by looking at rhinovirus infections or other infections. Um, it's about a factor between 0.23 and 0.2. The cost for each infection is 11,230 euros, which uh, is not that expensive, but still very expensive. But uh, we believe that uh, we uh, uh, avoided about 37,000 euros on nosocomial infections by having the proper isolation measurements. Unknown other costs for not sending a patient to another hospital because of lack of isolation rooms. We know it takes about two hours to um, get another hospital uh, ready for transmitting a patient, and then you have the cost of the, uh, transferring the patients. Uh, so that's um, something uh, we haven't really calculated yet. But the total cost or the total benefit is green. It's about 150,000 to 200,000 euros in our situation, or it's about between three and 400 euros per result. So it's cost beneficial in my view, actually in our view. But the question is, how do you get that money? That's still a big, a big issue. 
So um, looking at the diagnostic triangle, I, I show you the extended diagnostic tr uh, triangle. It's not only diagnostics, not only turnaround time, not only quality, but also the uh, factor of infection control is very important. What do we do with treatment? How many uh, uh, treatment options or antibiotic uh, did we avoid it? And what are the costs or the euro hours? So these are all the parameters you have to take into account if you look at the extended diagnostic triangle. There are still questions we still have to answer. That's why I call it still point of impact. So what about the percentage positive laboratory developed assays and negative point of impact testing? It's not that high as we have seen. Uh, um, there are usually a, a low number of viral loads, so viral load is low. The question is, is it clinical relevant? That's something we still have to solve. Another thing we have to solve, do we want and need quantitative data? Because now these essays are yes or no. We need to have data on performance out of the season of, uh, uh, for instance, respiratory uh, uh, season. So in the respiratory season, patients have high viral load. So what's happening if you want to use these essays out of season? Is that still of use or not? Another important issue, how do we get the financial benefit due to money that we didn't spend? Um, that's a, a very important issue, and we haven't been able to solve that yet, but something we have to put into the attention of our financial uh, directors. But also very important, we must put this patient centrally, more centrally in our discussions and somehow should ask him. Uh, a few final points. Um, quality control is very important. Um, we need to have good data on validation of these essays and verification of these essays. So as you know, uh, um, uh, quality control, uh, I'm involved in quality control of molecular diagnostics in Glasgow, actually in, uh, mostly uh, uh, present in Europe, but also in the United States and uh, some countries in Asia. Quality control is something we have to discuss. How do you deal with these uh, um, multiplex systems which can detect a number of viruses? And how do we deal with uh, performance data? How do you deal with uh, uh, changing the viruses over the seasons? And we have to find uh, um, something because whenever we look at it, the new ISO guidelines are putting more strict requirements uh, for introducing uh, these uh, uh, new essays which somehow are a black box, what we have to discuss with the companies, how we together, how together we can generate data that um, shows that uh, we take the responsibility in implementing these essays uh, as they are. ISO guidelines, ISO 15189 is very dominant in Europe. It's become mandatory, uh, also linked to insurance companies in uh, already a number of countries. So we have to discuss this uh, together. We have to find a, a solution, but uh, quality control programs have to um, have to be uh, designed to fit the purpose. You cannot just say something in the middle because that is not that good. It should be more practical. It should be cost effective. Um, it should meet our requirements for our clinical laboratory. It should also be uh, driven by uh, uh, reg regulatory requirements and educational requirements. Um, we should uh, keep up with the state of the art uh, that's uh, um, developing continuously, and it should be clinical relevant, meaning that it should be close to the clinical sample as closely as possible as we can get it. At the end, we're doing this for uh, uh, our patients. It, um, we all want to be uh, become old and stay healthy as long as possible, not to be infected uh, by uh, these terrible uh, bugs, whether these are viruses or parasites or bacteria, that's why I call it the silver generation. The, uh, the patient is definitely someone we have to put centrally. So my conclusion, point of impact testing can be good implemented in patient care in the emergency room. Can probably also be implemented in other situations, but this is what I showed you today. It is cost beneficial, definitely if you have a rapid turnaround time and the logistics make sure that you get the clinical sample rapidly 
So in our case, it's really just five minutes after the sample is taken from the patient. You also have to be aware of the fact that a negative result has an enormous uh, value and an impact on uh, patient care. Makes sense, but uh, um, I can just not stress uh, uh, as much as possible that this is a very important issue, being sure that you don't have these and these, and these viruses uh, being present at uh, this moment. It's a um, diagnostic point of view. From a diagnostic point of view, this point of impact uh, testing is uh, six to uh, ten times higher beneficial uh, for the uh, film array compared to the laboratory developed assays, even higher if you take the whole process from patient admission to the emergency room until you get the result back. It also highlights the need for molecular testing in, uh, in our diagnostic repertoire. That's something we know, and uh, uh, why are this uh, uh, monocular testing uh, has a number of advantages. It is quickly, but it also um, assists us in uh, explaining serious illness, and, but it also uh, assists us in looking for the clinical relevance of other viruses being not only influenza and RSV, and not being only the viruses as it is. And I'll show you an example why. Here are my final slides. We all know that in the summer of 2014, all of a sudden, a new virus, a respiratory virus, appeared. It was the enterovirus uh, D68. So I'm not sure that I can see the slide. Oh, there it is. Uh, and we know it has a huge impact in the United States. There was in the beginning a discussion how relevant is this uh, in uh, Europe. And in Groningen, we have a routine uh, uh, sequencing program, and we already noticed at the same time that this virus is also present in the city of Groningen, and therefore it's very unlikely that's only present in the city of Groningen. It must be more and more rare in uh, other parts in, uh, in Europe, which it is, or actually which it was. And the question is then, if we are all connected to each other by, because we are flying continuously, is a respiratory virus, are we connected? Are the viruses in Europe and the United States uh, connected? And we know the answer. By sequencing, we know that it doesn't make any difference. These viruses are appearing very rapidly. They are moving around over the world globally. And um, we just have to be sure that we include them in our diagnostic repertoire uh, if needed. And we can. We can do this uh, by being sure that the assays we are using are able to detect these new appearing viruses as they are. So I'd like to thank you so far for listening um, uh, to what I told you, and I hope you uh, understand my Euro Hour concept, which I think is uh, one way to make uh, the concept of cost and benefit more uh, visible. And this is one of the uh, final slide. This is the final slide of our entrance of the building uh, at night. Thank you so far. So now I'm open questions. Uh, Bert, uh, I had one observation and one question listening to your talk. Uh, I was thinking, you know, perhaps point of impact testing may somewhat ironically be more valuable on the cusp of uh, influenza season. I think a lot of emergency physicians, uh, assuming high prevalence during epidemics, are probably going to get uh, the odds in their favor, but particularly in the U.S. with a very unusual uh, cadence to our flu season this year. It's It's been quite extended and quite late. I suspect yeah. we're missing more um, of these diagnoses clinically at the beginning and ending of uh, flu season. Uh, so that was just a thought I had. But a question I had was, do you foresee possibility uh, down the line of um, film array or uh, some other on the horizon technology ever evolving into being really uh, what we would call truly um, point of care testing, in other words, driving it down potentially even to the triage nurse level um, where uh, your Euro uh, hour calculation would um, improve dramatically and we'd be talking about minutes versus hours here. How how feasible is that potentially technologically, you know, in terms of the cost of these devices and um, the size of them? Yeah, I, th I think uh, we are now in a, in a very exciting phase. In the next few years, I can uh, really imagine that we get uh, more more what did, uh, we should call point of care testing or near patient uh, testing, for instance, at the emergency room. 
The question is who has to be responsible for that and who has to perform it. Um, and now it takes about, say, um, 70 to 80 minutes before you have all the results uh, available. But you see that the technologies are uh, going, uh, being developed so rapidly that uh, I can assume that within five years you can do 20 viruses in 20 minutes or even more rapidly, but say in 15 minutes. And that, of course, is great because then uh, the bottleneck will probably be the physician uh, being uh, ready to take the, the sample from the patient. And these devices are becoming uh, more smaller, uh, that's for sure. Um, and uh, I think we should um, all encourage uh, work together, diagnostic companies and uh, clinical centers and, and diagnostic centers to develop that and to implement that um, because at the end it's for the benefit of the patient as it is. And I agree with you. Um, at this moment, you, uh, there's a huge uh, influenza uh, season still going on also in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, but not only influenza and RSV, we also see other, other viruses uh, popping up continuously. It's still heavy. So uh, um, point of impact will be point of care in five to ten years, I'm sure. Uh, we have a question from uh, Manuel de Miguel. Uh, he'd like you, if possible, to describe the PCR principle a little bit further for the uninitiated. Um, the... Uh, how the, how the PCR works, you mean? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I think all the PCR-based uh, systems, uh, the first thing that happens is that you uh, be sure that you inactivate all nucleases uh, to um, avoid uh, degradation of RNA and DNA. So um, fiber rapidly in these systems, you get some kind of lysis buffer which inactivates uh, enz uh, these enzymes, DNases, RNases. Um, in this case, for the film array, uh, then... Uh, you have some kind of magnetic beat beater, which uh, destroys all the cells so that you get these uh, viral particles uh, free and the DNA and the RNA freely available in a, in a more liquid um, environment. And then by using uh, normal uh, amplification uh, assays, pr a lot of primers and um, some kind of probes, uh, you can amplify actually everything uh, out of these clinical samples. It's uh, not really a... Um, different from a classical PCR systems. The, the, the nice thing is that all nuclear acids uh, bind to um, sealite. Sealite is actually very fine uh, sand, and you can make this now magnetic, so kind of magnetic sand, and then you can move particles uh, just around uh, an instrument. So um, technology is not that um, um, difficult. Uh, the more difficult difficulty is uh, how to avoid uh, uh, a specific um, detection, but that's been nicely solved in this system. And the new system also, the new system that are uh, developed, uh, being developed also have a nice uh, detection uh, system as it is. I hope that answers the question. I hope so too. Um, well, I'd like to thank Dr. Niesters for his presentation today. And, of course, uh, all the attendees uh, around the world. If you have any further questions I might add, please send them along, uh, and we'll pass them along to Dr. Esters, and he'll try to contact you later with an answer. Uh, and don't forget that there will be a recording of the webinar, which will also be available online very shortly. Thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you have a good day. Okay, thank you very much.